All right, so Shane last week did an introduction to the Gospel of John, and that's where we're going to be starting this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 1. So in your Bibles, your paper copy or your electronic copy, whichever you prefer, flip open to John chapter 1, and we're going to start. So um, as I start, what do you... What do you say about a passage that most of us have probably heard many sermons on? You know, what do you say about a passage that uh, most of us, you can at least quote part of it probably? Um, and so this morning what I want to focus on is just some reminders of who Jesus is. Um, at work, we work with an email program called Outlook, and it's Microsoft Outlook, and it does emails and it does your calendar too. And so on Monday morning, actually every day, I go into work and the first thing I'm usually greeted with is a pop-up reminder with which meetings I have in the next hour, which meetings I have in the next 15 minutes, which ones I'm already late for, um, if, uh, depending on what time I wake up. But um, the, uh, the idea of the reminder is to, to spark you know, a reminder, obviously. And a lot of times I get so annoyed by them. You know, I see this list of reminders, I'm like, ignore, 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 ignore. Like, oh, these things irritate me, especially if you have like three meetings triple booked in the morning. You're like, then you get six reminders and you're like, dismiss, dismiss, go away. Um, but I've, I've noticed that when the reminders break, I miss meetings. I'm late to meetings. The, the reminders serve a purpose for something, even though they might annoy me sometime. If I changed my attitude towards them, they are actually helpful. So this morning, even if we've heard all the stuff that's going to be presented this morning about this passage, at least let it be a good attitude, uh, have your good attitude towards the reminders of just what John is really presenting about Jesus, about our Savior this morning. So um, I know that some sermons on John... It can go a long time. We're, we're probably not going to go very long this morning. Um, my wife says, yeah, right. Every time you say that, you go for like an hour. But um, it's, it's probably not going to be very long. But again, the idea is let's just pick up some of these, these reminders. Maybe there's some new insight in here this morning. Maybe not. If it is, again, just let this be a reminder about the reality of Jesus. All right. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Uh, and there's been so much written, discussed, argued about, even about this first verse in John. Uh, I know there's some sermons out there who can go 40 minutes just on the first verse of John. Um, and so there's a lot to discuss in that. Uh, we're not going to go into a 40-minute uh, sermon on just this first verse. But what I want to, to focus on is what John is really trying to say here. And again, this is you can get way into the Greek and the technicalities and, and this and the that. Um, but each gospel starts its own way. Matthew starts with the genealogy, the history of Jesus, right? Mark starts by just um, basically assuming that Jesus is already around and starts with his baptism and, and starts his ministry, just kind of goes like, oh, Jesus is here, let's just get to what he's doing. Uh, you know, Luke has the classic Christmas story that most of us are used to that we just went through uh, at Christmas time. And John here starts back in the beginning, and in the discipleship hour, we started with uh, 1 John, which uh, starts very similarly to this. So we've actually discussed some of these concepts already this morning. But again, here's a reminder of them. <clears throat> uh, and I think really this in the beginning, though, probably goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and probably the idea of in the beginning of the Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and desolate and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning on day one. So John, in John chapter 1, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. I think really the, the idea that, in, that John is impressing upon us is the Word, which is Jesus, existed. In the beginning, wherever you consider the beginning, right, God already was, Jesus already was, He existed, He's eternal, is what John is saying. 
He was with God, meaning there's this idea of witness comes up a lot in the, the first part of John. So it's not an adversarial. In, in, in uh, Shane's introduction, you know, there was a couple of ways that uh, in, when he was taking Greek that this could be interpreted, you know, that um, this isn't an adversarial relationship, but Jesus is distinct. And I think it was an against that you said. The, some people could translate it against, but not in the sense of like we're adversaries, but in the sense of distinct from. They're actually separate people, the Father and the Son. Um, and then not only was he with God, but he was God. And, you know, we, uh, we, there's a lot of discussion on this verse and how to translate it in our Jehovah's Witness uh, friends, you know, take it a, a different way. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that maybe in a little bit. Uh, but the word was God, I think it's, it's pretty clear, not just with one little translation word, if you put an A, God, as opposed to God in there, but if you look at the entirety of the entire passage, if you look at the entirety of the rest of the passage we're going to go through, I think John makes it pretty clear that the idea he's trying to impress is that Jesus was God, not just a created being by God, but he was God. And then he repeats, he was with God in the beginning. So John, no matter how you take this verse, John wants to impress upon his readers that Jesus had a witness with God. He was with God. He repeats that twice in the beginning. So this is an eternal once beginning started. They already were here. They already had a relationship going, you know, from eternity past in this first part. Through, in verse 3, he continues, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He brought all things into existence, and... Uh, I've known a few Jehovah's Witnesses throughout my life. Uh, one was a pretty good friend, still is a good friend. I haven't uh, talked to him honestly in a while, though, but uh, he's come out of that. He's probably more agnostic at this point. Um, but when we went uh, up to uh, Toronto, we were doing some, some mission stuff in Toronto. We actually went to one of the big printing presses for uh, the Jehovah's Witness organization, and uh, we had a, a chance to talk with them a little bit. And this, this type of passage came up, you know, what does this mean? Because in the Jehovah's Witness uh, theology, they believe that Jesus was created, that God created Jesus. Uh, he was the first created being, and then out of that, everything else was created. Um, this passage, though, says, through him all things were made. Not some things or most things, but everything was made. It says, not one thing that came to being... <coughs> Nothing was made that has been made if, apart from Jesus. So if Jesus was a created being, that wouldn't be all things. Um, and if I actually looked at the Jehovah's Witness translation of this in the New World Translation, and it actually says, all things came into existence through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. Um, and so they've, you know, I'm sure if we asked them directly about it, how does that work if if all things had to be created by Jesus. How did he get created if he's part of all things? Anyway, um, I, I'm sure that you know they, they would have a response and we could have a dialogue about that. But I think John's making it very clear that Jesus wasn't created. All of creation came to being through him as the word. And if you think about the word of God, um, again, the logos or the logos, there's lots of sermons that can be preached on that. But if you just think about the English word, word, that's odd. So uh, if you just think about the word, though, it's the expression of, it's the, the outworking of the inner being of God. And, uh, and you see that in his creative aspect. And you see Jesus producing forth the word. It's, it's Jesus being, you know, produced outwards in that, that expression of him through the creation, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, this light of the world and this, this creative process, I think, can have a dual meanings. Um, the life that, that he brings, number one, the life of creation, I think, number one. So everything was brought into being, and that, that life force had to be brought forth in that. So he's the light of mankind in that sense, and that he, he you know, brought us into being. Not only that, though, he himself entered into the world as a light to show us how to be human, 
how a perfected human was supposed to be, how a perfected human was supposed to have relationship. In that sense, he is a light of life also. In a third sense, he's also the light and life of mankind because of his sacrifice and his ability to reconcile us to him and bring us life spiritually. So I think that John probably has a, a couple of ways that he's using this uh, to say that Jesus is the light of the world and particularly the light of mankind. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning to the light, and so that through him all might believe. Verse 8, he himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. This is, as I was preparing for this this morning, this is one of the, the parts that, you know, I hadn't really thought about too much in terms of, like, why, why does Jesus in particular and the Bible give such a, you know, uh, calling out to the purpose of John being a witness. Um, Hannah, uh, around the dinner table this week, Hannah asked a question about uh, our legal system. She said, why do people sue each other? I was like, that's an interesting question, but let's talk about it. So we, we talked about how our legal system, at least in our country, works. You know, how we say, okay, well, if someone feels like something did something wrong against them, then you can go fill out some forms and take it before a judge or a court, and they try to figure out the truth of the matter of what you are accusing somebody of or what you are being accused of. And the whole point of that is to find truth. And as part of that truth-finding process, we bring forth our arguments, we bring forth um, evidence, and we bring forth witnesses. And the point of witnesses is to try and establish what the truth is. And so my question then as I'm reading through this, I'm like, well, why did John have to be a witness? Like, isn't Jesus just good enough on his own, right? Most of us would say that, yeah, John, you know, Jesus doesn't need a witness. He's all powerful. He can do it on his own. And it, it was interesting as I, I thought about the relationship between a witness in our court system and a witness as, as the Bible talks about witnesses and how we're to be witnesses. It's interesting that it's, it's for the establishment of truth of who Jesus is. Um, how many people like to turn on the TV and see somebody selling a product that they made and they endorse themselves and it's everything about me, me, me? If a person stands up and is testifying about themselves a lot of times, we tend to be pretty skeptical. Like, well, you, you got your own vested interest in this. How can we believe you, really? But if you have multiple people saying and witnessing to the truth of that person, then you're a little more... Uh, uh, What's the right word I'm looking for? You're a little more, what's that? Accepting. Yeah, accepting. You're a little more uh, willing to pay attention and say, oh, maybe there is some truth to this that we need to look into. And again, I, I don't think that, uh, again, Jesus needed a PR guy. He didn't need a hype man, you know, per se. But as humans and as, as we look at witness, it's important uh, to see other people saying, yeah, that's true, That. Uh, you know that, and we talked about it this morning in discipleship hour, and and uh, Ruth talked about it as we see fellow believers coming around and and God using other people and other Christians and other uh, uh, ways of witnessing and helping one another. That's just another example to us in terms of, of the witness of Jesus and really seeing Jesus for who He is. So I think that that John being this witness is important, uh, and it's brought up several times by Jesus and by other people in the Bible that John was an important witness. And it's interesting their births, too. Both of them had miraculous births, Jesus and John, the Baptist, that is. Yeah, it's confusing because we're in John talking about John, which is a different John. But, yeah, we're talking about John the Baptist now, right, as the witness. So Jesus had a miraculous birth. We're all pretty familiar with that. But John the Baptist also had a miraculous birth, in a sense. It wasn't a virgin birth, but his parents were outside of childbearing years, but they really wanted a kid, and they were praying for it, and they were praying for it, and God answered their prayers. And it's, it's interesting that whenever we see that power, whenever we see God working in miraculous ways, that's a, a sign for us to pay attention, that we need to pay attention. And so even in the birth of John the Baptist, that's one of the ways that we can say, okay, we need to pay attention to this guy because we've seen miracles already from his conception that's happened for him, and we should pay attention to what he says. And uh, at the time, especially, and even now, we should have you know, some respect for John the Baptist and the witness that he provided uh, for Jesus. Verse 
verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world, uh, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And this section also, I think, harkens back to Genesis 1 and this idea and the motif of light, which we also talked about in the discipleship hour this morning, that there's, there's something to the idea of light, you know, that light, uh, if you bring light around, darkness can't hide from it, darkness can't escape from it, and Jesus is, is uh, being displayed here as the light being brought into the world as well. Uh, it's also interesting that uh, light, at least visible light as we see it, it requires energy. Darkness requires no energy. And so one of the things that, that I think is important or that, that can be taken out of this is as we see visible light, what we see is God's active energy being poured into the world. It takes uh, the creative effort, creative aspect, and creative creation as itself took energy from God to display and to put forth. And light itself takes energy. If you don't have energy, if you don't have electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation, you can't have light can't have visible light. You have to have an energy source of some kind. And as the, the light of the, the world, as Jesus brought in energy into the world, he brings that energy and power to do things, to actually be creative, to be the savior of the world. And he takes that energy with him. He didn't just come and sit on the couch and uh, watch TV while he's here and have no energy, right? He actually had energy as he was being brought into the world and as he operated in the world. Uh, believing in this light also allows us to be adopted into his family. Um, this is not something we can do on our own, of our own power, of our own will. It was his grace and glory that allowed that to happen. Um, and this idea of adoption is, is, is really interesting to me, too, be, uh, as I was thinking about a particular aspect of this adoption. And it's interesting, we also touched upon this as well in Discipleship Hour on, on adoption. Um, I've been around, I've, I've known kids that were adopted, I've been friends with them, I've known parents who have adopted kids, and in fact, the Bratchers, Jeremy and Corey, who used to be at this church with us, just adopted uh, two little girls, and we saw them a couple months ago when they were here, actually, but that, that adoption process is finalized now, and they had their first Christmas, you know, as, a, uh, as an actual adopted family, which was pretty cool. Um, but I was thinking about it... Uh, you hear some horror stories sometimes about, you know, especially if you have some natural kids and some adopted kids trying to blend those together. And I, horror stories may be the wrong word, but yeah, there can be some tension there sometimes. I heard one comedian talking about it, his or her sister, actually. She was naturally born from the parents biologically, and they adopted uh, another sister. And she said, you know, uh, the natural born one was speaking. She was the comedian saying her sister was so mean to her. And whenever she was being so mean to her, she would be so quick to go, well, I'm going to go talk to my mom. You know, it was like, ouch, you know. Um, when you look at Jesus and you look at what he did for us, it's amazing that we have a brother, in a sense, being God's son, um, who fought for us, who continues to fight for us, who died for us to be included in that family, and he's never against us. He's never bitter about us being included and being adopted into the family of God. And that is amazing to think about to me, is, is not, only does, not only did he do that, not only did he come and die for our sins, but he knew what that meant in terms of being adopted and having fellow heirs and fellow brothers and sisters alongside him, and he was never bitter about that. And that, that's amazing to me because, you know, I've often thought about, you know, what happens if, if I was adopted or if we adopted, there would still be, you know, it, it seems to me that I'd still have a difference, you know, between my natural kids and the adopted kids. And make no mistake, Jesus is still separate from us. There's still a difference between Jesus and us, but his, his love and compassion that he has for us to come and bring us into his adopted family, never be bitter about that, uh, is amazing to me. It's also uh, in 
Exodus, uh, what did we talk about next? Let's talk about actually the Hebrews passage. So um, part of that, that also coming into the world, that being brought forth into the world in Hebrews chapter 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, that is the Son of God, let us hold firm in the faith that we profess. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne uh, with grace and confidence so that we may receive the mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Uh, there's times in which I think that we really relate to somebody and to people who have been where we are. Um, somebody who comes along and says, you know what, I really know what you're going through. I too have done whatever. I, I too have had problems with my parents. I too have had problems with my brothers and sisters. I too have lost my job. I too have... Uh, lost a family member, or I too have had joy in whatever the situation you're, you're having is. There's something to it, a shared experience that really is relatable to, to other people. And, and one of the things that, that Jesus brought when he came forth as flesh, when he came to be in the flesh with us, was that ability to sympathize with us, to empathize with us, to be being tempted the same as we are, yet he never sinned, um, you know, was amazing to us. And in that sense that we have a high priest who can understand what we're going through, can, can understand being tempted, that can understand the struggles we go through. And uh, in that relationship, that relational aspect is very appreciative, I think, as, as well, that we should appreciate Jesus for. Verse 15 John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one that I spoke of you about. He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, and grace, truth, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only, <coughs> uh, the only Son, who is himself God, and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So John ends his introduction by once again reaffirming Jesus' special place with a special relationship with God the Father. Um, again, we talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses, who I think, uh, I'm not a Greek expert, but from everyone who I've read who is a Greek expert, secular, non-secular Greek experts, you know, agree with the the uh, mainstream Christian interpretation of, of John 1.1 1, 1 in terms of the translation from the Greek that Jesus isn't a God, he actually is God. Uh, but again, as I said, if you walk through this entire passage, John's whole point throughout the passage, whether you interpret that one little A or not A, put that aside, look at the rest of the passage in, in completeness, the entire passage is saying Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. He, John ends in, in verse 18 with, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known that Jesus and God have a special relationship that's outside of us that we can't have because they are God. And, and he, uh, he reaffirms that in verse 18, that, that Jesus is God. Um, in Exodus, Moses was saying, asking God, please show me your glory. And God said, I myself will make all of my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious I will show compassion for whom I will show compassion. And he further said, You cannot see my face, for mankind shall not see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, and I will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. None of us can take the full glory and majesty of God. You know, none of us can. Jesus Christ can and has seen glory because he is God and he shares that in common with God. Um, that's just amazing to me again. And, and we're thankful, I'm thankful, that we have uh, a Savior who brought us in, who, the ability to at least be in the presence of the Lord by washing away our sins. So as we wrap up, uh, a few reminders again through this whole passage. Who is Jesus? Jesus is eternal. Jesus is divine, he's creator, he's life for humanity, he's hope for humanity, and he's worthy of our witness. One of the, the things you, you see in this as you walk through this entire passage is you see essentially the gospel John lays out in the, 
in the first chapter. He, he says who God is. He gives, again, when, when he talks about coming into the world and some people reject him and some people don't, he's giving the presentation. You give a witness. You give you know, evidence. You give uh, a relationship. You give the hope. And some people accept that and some don't. You have the entire process of, of salvation through the first chapter of John in the way that it, it works out. Um, so a lot packed into this. And again, a few reminders just from this of who Jesus is why it's important we get Jesus right. A lot of things go wrong when you start messing with Jesus and who Jesus is. We see a lot of theologies go crazy. We see a lot of um, world systems go crazy when you start tinkering with, when you start changing who Jesus is. And it's really important that we focus. We try to get, and I don't have all of Jesus right. You know, There's some of my beliefs about Jesus that are probably wrong. But I'm going to try very, very hard to get Jesus right. And it seems to me that as John presents this, John presents Jesus as eternal, divine, as God, as creator, life of humanity, hope for humanity, and worthy of our witness. Let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, the gospel of John. We thank you for his presentation of him and um, <laughs> just the unique and special way that John says we need to pay attention to your son. And I, I pray that we pay attention to that. I pray that throughout our life, God, that we, we try every day to get our view of Jesus more correct and our relationship with Jesus more correct. And as we get it more correct, um, I pray that we're able to witness to that to other people so that they can see clearly who Jesus is, why he's so special, and why we should be so thankful that he came for us, died for our sins, and allowed us to be adopted into his family, into your family, without bitterness, with joy even, um, the joy that, that he saved the sheep that he did. And we're, we're thankful for that. I'm thankful for that, God. I pray for uh, us in this room, God, that we would be able to witness to other people about that. In Jesus' name, amen.